Thank you all for joining us for today's SONA webinar series. I'm Mahmoud Bukaramena, a research fellow in neuroscience at the University of Sussex, and I'm also a member of the organizing team for the SONA webinar series. Uh, as you all know, SONA is the umbrella society for all groups uh, pursuing neuroscience in Africa, and the main aim of this webinar series is to make neuroscience accessible to everyone bring renowned neuroscientists to interact with researchers around the world, but especially in Africa. And today I'm very excited to say that we have Professor Taras Fares jones who is the acting co-director of Center for Discovery in Brain Sciences at the University of uh, Edinburgh. She's also a professor of neurodegeneration, as well as UK Dementia Research Institute program lead. Tara had her PhD at the University of Oxford, PhD in neuroscience, following which she pursued a postdoctoral research at the Massachusetts Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And uh, after that, she became an, uh, an instructor in the Massachusetts Hospital in Harvard Medical School, followed by um, assistant professorship at the same center. In 2013, she joined the University of Edinburgh as a reader and chancellor's fellow, following which she rose up to the rank of professor of neurodegeneration in 2017. Tara sits on, a board, uh, on, on the board of many panels, grants, as well as journals. For example, she's the founding editor in chief of the uh, new journal called Brain Communications. And uh, she is a prolific scientist. She has published over 100 papers and for her work, she has been awarded several awards. And at the same time, she, uh, she is a fence Kavli Network of Excellence Scholar, uh, serving between 2014 and 2018. And uh, Tara, at the same time, is an active science communicator. She does a lot of public engagement. And at the moment, based on her Wikipedia, based on information I got on Wikipedia, she is um, she sits on the Scottish Science Advisory Council. I'm really, really excited that we have Tara here with us today, who is an expert in neurodegeneration, and she has been researching synapse for nearly two decades. And today, she will be talking to us about dissecting the role of synaptic pathology in Alzheimer's disease. Tara, you are welcome, and we are so, so excited and honored to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you so much for the kind introduction and the kind invitation. I'm really excited. This is my first talk to an African and really global uh, group of neuroscientists and, and hopefully interested people who aren't neuroscientists. Uh, so I also can't see myself. It's also my first webcast and my, my nine-year-old son is very excited that I'm now a YouTuber, but I can't see my own picture. So I hope you can see me and the slides and that I'm not making terribly funny faces the whole time. And I also hope that I'll get some questions from you at the end. So please do uh, think of any questions you have. I'd be very happy to answer or try to answer. Although the answer is quite often, I don't know, but I'll show you some of the things that we do know for the next sort of 40, 45 minutes. First, I'll start with this declaration of interest so that you're all aware that I have affiliations and I'm very grateful for uh, my affiliations as mentioned with UK DRI, Edinburgh and our Center for Discovery Brain Sciences. We're funded by multiple fantastic funding bodies and some of these are collaborators who are in the pharmaceutical industry, but none of these industry links are relevant for today. So what I'll talk about today is first introduce the topic that we work on and then I'll talk about how three different proteins are working together to damage synaptic connections in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease. So it's split into sort of two sections. The first part looking at APOE4 and how it affects synapse loss in Alzheimer's disease. And in the second part, looking at how amyloid beta and tau, two of the pathological proteins that accumulate in AD, cooperate to cause decreased transcription of synaptic genes and behavioral phenotypes. And before we get going into the data, these people, I hope you can see my mouse, are the lab that I've been working with for quite some time. This was one year ago, so it's not quite an up-to-date picture, but I'll try to remember as we go along to tell you which people contributed the most to collecting the data. It's been a, a real honor to work with all of these people. So first, to introduce the topic, why are we researching Alzheimer's disease and dementia? I mean, I'm, you probably are all aware of this growing problem 
you can see from this slide, which is from 2015, that there are 4 million people in Africa living at that time with a diagnosis of dementia. At the, today, we think it's about 50 million people worldwide. And these staggering numbers are really going to increase as our population increases. It's a good thing that we're living longer uh, population-wise because we have uh, improving healthcare. But with this longer lifespan comes the increased risk of developing age-associated diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Around the world, this is costing over $800 billion per year to care for people with Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementias. So this is a really unmet, uh, urgent need because we don't have any disease-modifying treatments for dementias. So what is dementia? Dementia is an umbrella term for a set of symptoms. It's a progressive loss of cognitive function, typically starting with memory problems, but spreading to encompass other aspects of cognition, including behavior and thinking uh, as the disease progresses through the brain. And dementia can be caused by any number of, of diseases, underlying uh, causes. And I'm showing those here on the right in a pie chart, you can see that Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, and that's what we'll focus on today. But I wanted to show you this so that you're aware there are many other things that can go wrong in the brain that cause this core set of dementia symptoms. So what is dementia in terms of what happens to the brain? Well, Alzheimer's disease was first described by Alois Alzheimer. I've got a picture of him here. And he described it at a meeting in 1907 about this woman, August Dieter. She came to him as a patient and she said, I've lost myself. And when she died, Alzheimer looked at her brain with cutting edge at the time microscopy techniques and silver staining. And he saw three core features that we still use today to diagnose Alzheimer's disease neuropathologically. Those three features are atrophy, and I'm illustrating that here, showing a coronal slice through a human brain, and you can see someone who died without Alzheimer's disease on the left, and a person who died with Alzheimer's disease here on the right. And I'll draw your attention to this particularly lovely curly little structure here. This seahorse-shaped structure is the hippocampus, which is very important for formation of memories and for learning. And that structure is really degenerated in Alzheimer's disease. You can also appreciate from this gross view that the neocortex along the outside of the brain is also atrophied or shrunken in Alzheimer's disease, particularly in the medial temporal lobe, which again is important for memory and learning. And when Alzheimer looked microscopically, he observed two lesions that he described and called plaques and tangles, and we still look at these today. Plaques we know now are formed of amyloid beta peptide largely, and they accumulate in the extracellular space in the brain, whereas tangles are made of a protein called tau that is normally in the microtubules, but during Alzheimer's disease, it becomes hyperphosphorylated, it comes off of the microtubules, and then it clumps up inside neuronal cell bodies in neurofibrillary tangles. So the plaques are labeled here in red and yellow, and the tangles are labeled in green. And this is just a cartoon version of what some of the things that go wrong in Alzheimer's disease brain that we see with uh, microscopic techniques. So the plaques are shown here in blue. We get this extracellular accumulation of plaques. I've drawn some neurons here in red. And in some of those neurons, you have uh, the accumulation of tangles that I'm showing here. We also see accumulation of astrocytes and microglia, so inflammation or gliosis, particularly in the region of plaques. And of course, we see the loss of neurons and synapses, and that's the neurodegeneration that causes this big loss of brain tissue that you can see in the gross view of the brain. But these things don't all happen at once. The pathology develops over many years in Alzheimer's disease. And that's become a real problem for translation and finding effective treatments. Because as you'll appreciate from this graph, where I'm showing you a schematic of aging on the x-axis and the amount of pathology or the amount of stuff measured in the brain on the y-axis, that we have a long prodromal phase. And that means a time where there is pathology accumulating in the brain, but there are no detectable symptoms. And during that time, we start to see amyloid beta plaques really ramp up. And in fact, by the time you can detect mild cognitive impairment, that's MCI, you already have a pretty much reached your plateau or limit of amyloid pathology in the brain. Early on in the disease, you start to lose synapses, and we'll talk a lot more about that. And you start to accumulate small amounts of tau pathology in 
the brainstem and medial temporal lobe, but it's really when you start to detect symptoms that the tau pathology ramps up, and that correlates very closely with the loss of neurons and the loss of synapses in AD. So you can imagine when we're trying to treat the disease out here in the late phases of disease, when you have Alzheimer's, full-blown Alzheimer's disease, you've already accumulated a huge amount of plaques, you've already lost a very substantial amount of neurons and synapses in the brain, and you've already got a substantial amount of tau pathology. And so far, our clinical trials have been mainly targeting this amyloid beta because it's very causatively linked to familial Alzheimer's disease. But those trials have been unsuccessful in treating people who already have the disease. And I think that's at least in large part because these treatments were started too late. So what we're particularly interested in, in my group, is looking at synaptic connections. So here is an, an electron micrograph of a synapse in a human brain. You can see the one micron scale bar. The presynaptic terminal contains lots of lovely little synaptic vesicles. The postsynaptic density here is shown as an electron dense region, and the signal propagates from the pre to the postsynaptic terminal. We're very interested in synaptic connections for many re reasons, not the least of which is they're my favorite part of the brain, but also because synaptic connections are crucial for formation of new memories and for learning. And the loss of these synaptic connections really closely parallels the symptoms in AD. In fact, of all the brain changes that we observe, these plaques, tangles, neuron loss and gliosis and synapse loss, the loss of synapses correlates most closely with the cognitive symptoms observed in the disease. This was first observed by several different groups, uh, Steve Dukoski and Steve Sheff, Eliezer Mazlaya and Bob Terry, and we've been following this up over the past few years. And just to give you an idea of the complexity of the brain, we don't, oh, sorry, I've, I've got a pop-up on the bottom here. So this is one of the big questions in the field that we're working on is how do pathological proteins contribute to synapse degeneration in Alzheimer's disease? And to give you an idea of the complexity of the brain, in your brain and in all of our brains, we have approximately 100 trillion or 10 to the 14th synaptic connections. And that's more synaptic connections in your brain than there are stars in our galaxy where there are only about 100 billion stars or 10 to the 11th. So this is part of the reason that we don't have effective treatments for diseases like Alzheimer's disease is the phenomenal complexity of the brain. So, before we get into the data, I'll introduce a couple more concepts. One is the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. I think about the risk factors or, or why some people get to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease in three main categories. One is age, that's the biggest risk factor, and that's one of the things we're working on in the lab. One is the genes that you inherit from your parents, and one is your lifestyle factors, so things like level of education and healthy diet and exercise and building up your brain reserve. What we'll focus on a little bit today is the genes. So I'm showing you here a, a graph taken from Robinson et al. and, and the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease from a couple of years ago that nicely illustrates the risk genes that we're aware of uh, for Alzheimer's disease. There are a few early onset Alzheimer's disease genes that guarantee if you inherit them that you will have the disease if you live long enough. And these are all involved in making that A-beta plaque peptide. But there are a whole host of genes that have been more recently discovered that increase your risk without being a guarantee of getting the disease. And we'll talk in particular today about ApoE4, which is the biggest genetic risk factor. If you inherit two copies of ApoE4, you have approximately 12-fold risk of inheriting Alzheimer's, of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to, have, to someone who doesn't have any copies of the ApoE4 allele. And if you inherit only one copy of ApoE4, which is apolipoprotein E epsilon 4, then you have about a threefold increase in your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So one of the other outstanding questions in the field that we're trying to address is how do these gene changes increase your risk of disease? So how are we going from these genetic polymorphisms to the underlying biology that causes these brain changes that ultimately result in dementia. Um, and then the final thing I want to really emphasize is that I've been talking a lot about synapses and neurons, and that's what we focus on mainly in the lab, but the brain is not just made up of neurons. You've got a lot of other cell types. So I'm showing here an illustration from a review that we wrote recently showing the complexity of the brain in terms of having multiple glial cell types and vascular cell types. And we know from data that's been emerging recently, particularly in genetics, that glia are important for influencing your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk a little bit about that as the talk goes on. <laughs> 
So here's the big research questions that I'll talk about today in the two parts. So the first, we'll be talking about APOE and this risk factor, APOE4, and how it influences synapse degeneration. And we want to know what causes synapse loss and can we prevent or reverse it. And the second part, I'll talk about how amyloid beta and tau are interacting to cause synapse degeneration and cognitive impairment in a mouse model. And at the very end, I'll try and bring these two stories together and hopefully you'll understand why I'm presenting them uh, together in the same talk. So what I'll try to convince you of for the next half hour or so, I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time so I don't run over, uh, is there are multiple pathological proteins that are contributing to synapse dysfunction and loss in Alzheimer's disease. And importantly, at least in our mouse models, these changes are reversible. Synapses are amazingly plastic structures. So you have neurons in your brain and most of them have been there since before you were born. You get some new neurons and you get some pruning and development and we lose some neurons as we age, but not many. But synapses, you make new synapses and lose synapses and strengthen them and weaken them all the time as part of your normal learning and plasticity. So my hypothesis is, in our group, we think if we can intervene to prevent the damage to synapses, we would, could allow them to actually recover. And that might be able to uh, allow some cognitive or functional recovery. And how are we getting at these big questions? We're using multiple model systems. We look at human postmortem brain tissue. We look at mouse models and we look at cells in dishes, uh, some human iPSC derived neurons and some mouse neurons. And we use a combination of imaging and molecular techniques. And I'll talk about some of these today. I think it's important to keep in mind that we need to use multiple approaches to come at these translational questions because each of these systems has its own strengths and weaknesses. And historically in our field, we have been uh, failing to translate really good science from mice into therapeutics that help people in part because of some of the relative strengths and weaknesses of the different model systems. And one of the techniques that we use an awful lot in the lab is called array tomography. And it's not something that many labs around the world do. So I have a video that Rosie Jackson made when she was a PhD student here. And in the lab, we have Jamie Rose, who is instrumental in collecting our human cases uh, every time somebody agrees to donate brain tissue postmortem. And we have a postdoc, Dr. Marti Colon Cadena, who has really revolutionized how we analyze these data. But what I'll do now, I'll try and make sure the sound is not on here for you. I'll show you an example of how this technique works. So what happens when someone agrees to donate brain tissue, either someone with Alzheimer's disease or an unaffected family member or people with other diseases, is the neuropathologists call us and tell us there's a case and we go down, usually Jamie Rose goes down to the hospital and picks up these tiny samples. You can see the size that we get is, is, is very small, but we take 38 different brain regions. And then these are further sub-dissected into small one millimeter by six millimeter uh, by one millimeter blocks that are able to be fixed and processed for our array tomography technique, which is very similar to electron microscopy. So they're being fixed and now we're embedding them in a plastic resin, which is liquid. We're putting the brain samples in there in a little label. And then that liquid resin, when we bake it overnight, becomes hard. And that allows us to take these hard plastic embedded blocks and put them in this ultra cut machine and cut them with this diamond knife and we're doing that because we can then make 70 nanometer sections. This is important because the resolution of light microscopy in the Z direction or axial uh, direction is too poor to reliably look for co-localization of proteins within individual synapses. So here what I'm showing you is the diamond uh, knife face cutting the tissue into those 70 nanometer sections. These can then be put on a microscope slide. They're outlined here with a pat pen just to, uh, to make a, a a barrier for the water, and then we can stain them with immunohistochemistry, with immunofluorescence. So this is just dropping on some solution. We add an antibody to our proteins of interest, and then a secondary antibody to make that protein glow. And what that lets us do is go to the microscope and take images of these very thin sections, that's rosy there on the microscope. And this allows us to look at with very good accuracy in all three dimensions. In XY, the, the resolution of light microscopy is about 250 nanometers which is sufficient to see a 500 nanometer synapse. And now we've overcome the Z resolution limit by physically sectioning the tissue. And what you can see here is Rosie's taking a tile scan. So you can see all those serial sections we were taking on the ultra cut. You can see each of those little, uh, each of those little sections there. And then we can zoom in and find a pattern of nuclei that we can follow along the entire ribbon. So here's a plaque 
This is amyloid beta plaque labeled with an antibody. And we're finding the pattern of nuclei that surround that plaque. And then Rosie is gonna go tell the computer to find that pattern all the way along the ribbon. And then the computer tells the microscope where to go. And we take images at this 63X, so at high resolution, all the way along the ribbon. So that we're building up a three-dimensional reconstruction of a very small part of the brain. So here goes the microscope taking the images. You can see that flashing through the plaque and the dots are synaptic staining and the nuclei are labeled with DAPI. And it goes along and takes this three-dimensional uh, image stack, which we then have to process, which has become much easier lately with Marti Colon Codena's macros that we've written and are, are freely available online if you want to try this sort of thing. Uh, and we can analyze how many synapses are there and what proportion of them contain that red A beta. So that takes some computational changes. And here's a three-dimensional reconstruction of that small part of the brain you were looking at. So using that array tomography technique, one of the first thing we looked at is how amyloid beta and APOE are working together to cause synapse loss in human Alzheimer's disease brain and in mouse models of the disease. These are data showing from mouse models that we, we see loss of synapses around plaques. And this is summarizing my whole postdoc and early, uh, early faculty career in one slide. But what we see is that in multiple models of Alzheimer's disease, wherever we have these plaque pathologies, because we drive a transgene that has a human uh, mutation that causes AD, around those plaques, we see loss of synapses measured in multiple different ways. And what we can see here is that this happens over time and it's reversible. So when we look before applying an antibody to remove soluble A beta, I'm showing you here an example of a place where there's no spine. And then an hour later, after we treat, we already can see a new spine growing. So this was a study done back in Boston in Brad Hyman's group in collaboration with Elan Pharmaceuticals at the time, showing that we could recover synapses in mice, which I think is really important proof of principle. We then went on to look with this array tomography technique to see if we could uh, find out whether the oligomeric A beta is in particular inside the synapses in mice. And this was led by two students, Robert Kofi, who is an MD PhD student in Boston, and Ellie Pickett, who is a PhD student here in Edinburgh. And what they both found is that oligomeric A beta does accumulate inside individual synapses. And that happens most often here in the halo around the plaque, which I've drawn as a cartoon here, little wavy lines. So as you get closer to a plaque, the percentage of synapses that contain A beta goes up. And what Ellie found is that we could use multiple different markers of A beta. NAB61 sees big oligomers, 1C22 sees small oligomers, OC sees bigger oligomers, AW7 sees all A beta. And what we found is that all of these different antibodies label a subset of both pre and post synapses in the brains of these mice. What we found in collaboration with Eloise Houdry, who's at Harvard Medical School, is that when we overexpress ApoE4, which is, if you remember, the risk gene that increases your risk, we exacerbate the synapse loss in your plaques. And you can see it here in mice that overexpress GFP, so that's a control. Mice that overexpress ApoE2, which is a protective gene, ApoE3, which is the neutral gene, and ApoE4, which is the risk gene. And if you focus on the ApoE4 near plaque, there are not very many green dots, and those are the postsynaptic densities. And when we quantify that, you can see the synapse loss, the percentage loss near plaques increases in the E4 mice. More recently, Eloise's group collaborated with us when Rosie Jackson and Claudia Canavo were here in the lab. And we found that when Eloise knocked out ApoE altogether in the mice, we could prevent in the plaque-associated synapse loss. I'm not showing you the graph here, but you can almost see it here in the APP ApoE null line. And you see the red and green synapses near the blue plaques. There is not as much loss as there is in the mice that still have their APP, their ApoE, and those are the APP line. But those data that I just showed you were all from mice. And I mentioned earlier that I think it's very important that we also look in human brain and look at multiple different models to be sure that our findings are translatable. So Robert Kofi had a look in human postmortem tissue. So this is the same technique, the array tomography that I showed you the video of. And what he did was look near plaques in people who have Alzheimer's disease who either have an ApoE4 allele or who don't. So people who had either one or two copies of ApoE4 are shown here in green and people who have uh, no copies of ApoE4 are in blue on this synapse density graph. And what we saw is that as you approach plaques, very similar to what we saw in the mice, we have a loss of synaptic density, 
This is exacerbated in the APOE4 carriers. And when we looked with the multiple color uh, technique to look within individual synapses, like I'm showing here in the, in the image, to see the proportion of synapses that have APOE that also have oligomeric A beta, there was a vast increase, a five-fold increase in this proportion of APOE positive synapses that also had oligomeric A beta in the people who had the risk APOE4 allele. So these data indicate that APOE4 acts at least in part to increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease by exacerbating oligomeric A beta dependent synapse clumping and loss of synapses. More recently, we had a look at another risk factor called clustrin uh, and found that this is a very similar protein to APOE, which is it's an apolipoprotein. And we found when Rosie Jackson was here that clustrin also clumps up in synapses and that this is more often occurring in APOE4 carriers. So this is linking two risk factors now, uh, genetic risk factors with synaptic degeneration and with oligomeric A beta dependent synaptic degeneration. To understand whether this was entirely dependent upon A beta, we also took an unbiased approach. And this is a proteomic screen that we've just had uh, accepted in Acta Neuropath finally. Uh, and it was led by Rosie Jackson when she was here and then later on by Raphael Hesse. And this was a close collaboration with Tom Wishart's group at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh. And what we did is we took human Alzheimer's and non-demented control cases, post-mortem tissue, and instead of imaging it, this time we homogenized it and prepared synaptic neurosomes. And I'm showing you an image of that here. So you can see an electron micrograph of some of our synaptic neurosomes. And what this does is we filter the brain homogenate so that we have these little sealed off synapses. We have a presynaptic terminal here and a postsynaptic spine here. And then we took these synaptic neurosome preps and sent them off for proteomic analysis. These were from APOE3 carriers and APOE4 carriers and from two different brain regions, BA17, which is less affected in the disease or later affected in the disease, and BA4142, which is temporal cortex and is early on and heavily affected. The Western blots that I'm showing you here on the bottom are showing how we make sure that the synaptic preparation works. So homogenate is our crude homogenate and P is our, H is our homogenate and P is our pellet or synaptic pellet. And you can see, we looked for a few things. We made sure that there was an increase in the synaptic proteins in the pellet and that there was a loss of histone, which is a nuclear marker, just as a quality control measure because we didn't do electron microscopy on all of our preps. It would have taken us too long. The proteomics data were quite interesting. So this was my first uh, experience with proteomics. It was led by, the proteomics side was led by Dougie Lamont in Dundee and Tom Wishart at Roslyn. And what we found is that as we looked at the AD versus control synaptic proteome, we had increased numbers of proteins changing both up and down as we went up this gradient of vulnerability from APOE3 to APOE4 and from the less affected brain region to the more affected brain region. And this was unbiased, so we weren't looking at whether this was associated with A-beta. We had evidence from our imaging that there was at least some part of it was A-beta, but it also gave us a whole new set of hits to have a look at and see if we could figure out more of the things that APOE might be affecting in your synapses. When we did bioinformatic analysis of this using Ingenuity pathway analysis software, what we found was that when we looked at AD compared to control synaptic proteomes, we had changes in multiple canonical pathways and they're listed here. The top 15 up and down regulated are listed here. I'll draw your attention to the ones that I found really quite interesting it's, is that in the things that went up or, or red, we were finding a lot of things that were involved in neuroinflammation like acute phase response signaling, IL-6 signaling. Uh, and when we looked at things that were down regulated, we found many things that were involved in synaptic function like long-term potentiation and calcium signaling. And we also found oxidative phosphorylation, which is a mitochondrial function, was largely down-regulated in AD synapses compared to control synapses in the more affected brain region. This is interesting, this, this look at mitochondrial changes, because we had a, another study that had been led by Ellie Pickett, wow. systematically looking through the neocortex of people who have Alzheimer's disease compared to controls. And the thing that she found is that there were fewer presynaptic terminals that had a multiple mitochondria in AD cases compared to control in a temporal lobe region like we were examining with proteomics. So this is suggesting to me that we have multiple changes in the synaptic proteome of Alzheimer's disease and some of those might be affecting the mitochondria. The mitochondria might be less likely to get to the presynaptic terminals because of changes in tau which will directly affect axonal transport but we haven't confirmed that yet. 
So to summarize the bits that I've told you about for the first sort of half of the data, and the second half will be shorter, <laughs> we've looked and shown that APOE4 is influencing synapse de degeneration directly through A-beta, and also the proteomic data are suggesting that there are some inflammation uh, components or some glial components that are probably important for contributing to synapse degeneration, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. We also observed this decreased synaptic mitochondria that was associated with decreased um, oxidative phosphorylation genes in APOE4 carriers. So oligomeric A-beta in mice definitely causes synapse loss. APOE knockout was protective of this, and APOE4 exacerbated this again in the mice. And in the human brain, we could see APOE4 associated with more synaptic A-beta in synapses, with exacerbated synapse loss, and with altered synaptic proteomic signatures. And the new bit of this that I hadn't been really looking for, but the unbiased data were showing us that inflammatory proteins are increased um, in these AD synapses. So for the second part, and then I'll bring it back together at the end, I'll talk about how A beta and tau act cooperatively to contribute to synapse dysfunction and loss. Hopefully you'll remember from the beginning that A beta is the plaque protein, and we've just shown you a lot of data suggesting that oligomers or soluble forms of A beta contribute to synapse loss. Tau is the protein that accumulates in neurofibrillary tangles in the cell bodies. And a beta ramps up first and tau comes up later on in the disease process. And the predominating hypothesis in the field about the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease is what we call the amyloid cascade hypothesis. And I've got a very uh, simplified version of that here on this slide, where we think that increases in amyloid beta somehow cause changes in tau that are associated with synapse and neuron loss, and that's what's causing cognitive decline. So first I'll show you a little bit of evidence from mice that the tau protein, uh, especially forms of tau that are associated with frontotemporal dementia cause damage to synapses. These data were collected by Kathy Kopekina in Brad Hyman's lab when I was in Boston. This is a mouse model called the RTG4510 line that overexpresses a mutant form of tau that doesn't cause Alzheimer's disease, but it causes a frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism. And what Kathy observed is that there is a decrease in spine density, so that's a decrease in synapses in these RTG4510 mice. Importantly, this tau pathology in these mice is contributing to cognitive dysfunction measured with the Morris water maze. I'm showing you the water maze cartoon here. And these data are from uh, the 2005 paper when I was a postdoc that was led by Karen Ash's group who developed these mice. And what they observed is that you get a decrease in the time searching in the correct area for the platform after these mice have been trained. So this is a memory deficit. But when you turn off the tau transgene expression, so you lower soluble tau levels, the mice regain some cognitive function even in the presence of pathology that persists. So this is important. It's old data, but I think it's important because it's proof of concept that you can have recovery of cognitive function, at least in mice, when you stop the toxic insults to the synapses and the neurons. Our more recent data, which has just been accepted uh, very recently in cell reports, and the preprint is already online, suggests that the amyloid beta and wild type tau cooperates to disrupt cognition in mice. So in these experiments, we had four genotypes of mice. There were a, a consistently outbred strains, so all of these were litter mates. And we had mice that had no amyloid or tau and, and no endogenous mouse tau either, importantly. All of these mice are map tau null for endogenous mouse tau. So we had the map t null control mice, mice that had plaques only, APP, PS1. And these are the mice that I showed you lots of data of showing synapse loss around plaques earlier. We had mice that had human wild type tau. They don't develop pathology, but they're overexpressing normal human wild type tau. And then we had mice that had both, and those are shown in pink here. They had both plaques and tau. And what Ellie observed, and Jane Tullock, who was instrumental in, in making this line and aging it and characterizing it, is that these mice that have both plaques and tau develop a hyperactivity phenotype as measured in the open field. So that's just letting the mice habituate to an open field for four days and then measuring how much they run around. Traces of individual mice are shown here, and you can see that in the mice that have both A beta and tau, you get more running around in the chamber. And you can see that here at 10 and a half and 14 and a half months of age is significant in the mice when we quantify it. So there's a cognitive change in the mice that have both plaques and tau. We went on to look at transcription in these mice. And quite interestingly, what we found is in mice that have plaques only on the left, there were some increased transcripts, 81 
genes were expressed more highly in those compared to control mice. The tau mice didn't have very many changes at all, only six transcripts with the changes that met our criteria. But when we had both plaques and tau, we had a significant increase in the number of changes of transcription. And I'm showing you some of these, the, all the red transcripts have a greater than twofold change with an adjusted p-value of less than 0.05. And I've labeled some of them with the gene names just out of interest. So TREM2, which is another risk factor, goes up in our mouse model that has both plaques and tau. GFAP, which is an astrocyte-specific gliosis marker. C1QA, which is postulated to be a tag that labels synapses for loss, was also up in these mice. When we did pathway analysis of this RNA-seq data, we found that neuroinflammation signaling was the top hit. So again, like we had seen in the human proteomics data, it looks like the neurons in the glia are cooperating in this phenotype of synaptic degeneration and cognitive change. So we saw neuroinflammation signaling was increased in our mice. So were several other uh, important pathways that are involved in neuroinflammation, including the complement system. And of things that were downregulated, Calcium signaling was the, was the one that was, was downregulated significantly, as was synaptic long-term potentiation and depression. So again, similar to the human data, we were seeing inflammatory things go up and synaptic things go down in our new mouse model with RNA-seq. So this indicates to me that A-beta and tau are cooperating to cause synaptic dysfunction and cognitive impairment, and that neuron glia interactions are important in this process. Here are some of the students who contributed to this, this, these data. It took a long time and a lot of students and postdocs to con complete this study. So in this new mouse model, we were also able to turn the tau expression off by feeding the mice doxycycline. And when we did this, we could, have, we could cause a recovery of both the behavioral and the transcriptional phenotypes. So the mice were aged up to 10, 10 and a half months, where I showed you before, they, they already have this hyperactivity phenotype. Then they were treated either with vehicle or doxycycline, which is the way we suppress the tau transgene expression. And then they were sacrificed at 14 and a half months for the RNA-seq and pathology. And we saw behaviorally, this dox treatment completely prevented and even reversed the cognitive deficit. In terms of RNA-seq, what I'm showing you here is our mice that have both plaques and tau uh, with vehicle treatment versus Doc, um, for the versus doxycycline treatment. And you'll see looking at just if you focus on the top line, that neuroinflammation signaling, which was significantly up compared to controls in our mice at 14 and a half months is now actually decreased compared to controls when we've turned the tau transgene off. So everything that's gone from orange to blue has gone from an increase to a decrease with turning the tau off. And similarly, we saw usually a recovery or even a, a, a compensatory increase in the things that had gone down in our mouse model when we turned the tau off. You can see here, for example, that synaptic long-term potentiation gene expression is increased after DOX treatment compared to controls, whereas it was decreased if we treated with vehicle. When we looked pathologically in these mice, we saw, as expected, plaques are associated with local synapse loss. And that's here in the graphs showing that wherever we have plaques, the near plaque data, there's this decrease in presynapse density um, compared to far from plaques. When we treated with doxycycline, this did not recover the synapse density. The only thing we could detect with our array tomography technique in terms of the synaptic changes is that whereas before uh, treatment or vehicle treated mice had tau significantly in their synapses, whereas when we turned the tau off, we could remove the tau from the synaptic compartment. And this could be part of what's contributing to the phenotypic recoveries that we see. In this paper, we also had a look at human brain to be sure that tau was also in synapses in human AD to make sure that what we were seeing in the mice uh, could hopefully also be translationally relevant. And we did find in a, six AD cases and six controls that we could detect tau 13, which is a total tau antibody standing here in yellow, and also ALTS50 and a couple of uh, phosphoepitopes of tau. It was a smaller proportion of synapses contained tau than contain A-beta in these cases, but it is there, so we think our mouse data are potentially translationally relevant as well. And then the final bit of data, because I realize we're getting, we're getting towards uh, the end of the time. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. The final bits of data I'll tell you about are trying to tie these things together. So we observed neuron glia interaction, importantly, in our human proteomics data and in our mouse RNA-seq data.
And more recently, Marcus Dioras, who I'm showing you here, has been doing some work in human postmortem tissue and in culture to try and see if we can find evidence of microglia actually eating synapses or phagocytosing synapses in human brain. There's some great evidence from people like Beth Stevens and Soyeon Hong suggesting this is important in mouse models of AD, but to our knowledge, we haven't seen anyone to do this in human uh, brain tissue. So what I'm showing you here is Marcus's work staining non-demented control and Alzheimer's disease brain tissue for plaques labeled in blue. You can see one here in the Alzheimer's case. CD68, which he's confirmed uh, pathologically is a lysosomal marker of microglia and macrophages. And when we co-stain with IBA1 and TMEM97, most of the staining we see is microglial in this, in this preparation. And what we're showing you here is three-dimensional reconstructions of synaptic proteins in green, CD68 and the plaques. And we can see, even in controls, a little bit of synaptic protein inside CD68 positive microglia. And in AD, we see a significant amount of, of synaptic protein inside the lysosomes of microglia. And when we quantify this in two different brain regions, both in the BA17 and BA2021, so an occipital and temporal region, we see a significant increase in the percent area of co-localization of CD68 and synapsin-1 in AD compared to controls. So this is some further information suggesting that neuron glia interactions are important for synaptic degeneration in Alzheimer's disease. But what we see in the human postmortem tissue is a snapshot at the end of the disease. So Marcus wanted to go a little bit beyond that and make sure that what we were seeing was reflective of actual phagocytosis. And to do this, he, he's working with Barry McCall and our collaborator, Veronique Miron. And we had human resected microglia. So this is from surgical colleagues who were doing surgery for epilepsy. And when they go in to take out the bit of the brain that's causing the temporal lobe epilepsy, they accidentally, or sort of, they have to by necessity, take out a little bit of healthy overlying brain tissue just to get down to the focus. And normally that's discarded, but we had ethical uh, permission and consent to use some of that tissue to make microglia uh, in the lab for research purposes. And Marcus took these microglia and fed them synapses, synaptoneurosomes, like we've done for the proteomics, that had been labeled with Frodo, which is a dye that only fluoresces when the pH goes low. So what we're seeing here is microglia in phase contrast here with blue nuclei. And they are internalizing these synaptoneurosomes that are tagged with Frodo. So you can see this red glow means these microglia have phagocytosed the human synapses. When we quantify this, uh, Marcus can show that it's phagocytosis because he can block it with this sit D. And when we quantify the speed of this happening, we see that AD synapses, so those are synapse synapse neurosomes prepared from Alzheimer's disease cases. They're eaten a little bit more and a little bit faster than synapses that were made from people who didn't have AD. And that's quantified here as area under the curve. There's a little difference, but significant in AD versus non-demented control. And also in the time to half max. So we have a, a faster and increased phagocytosis of human synapses by living human resected microglia. So to summarize this second part of the talk and sort of putting it together with the first half, what we see is that in mice, A-beta causes this inflammation and local synapse loss around plaques. And in mice, the A-beta and the tau cooperate to cause a behavioral phenotype and transcriptional downregulation of genes important for synaptic function. When we lower the tau levels in the mice, we reduce the synaptic tau accumulation, and we also see a really impressive, in my mind, recovery of both the behavioral and transcriptional phenotypes. Uh, we also see that synaptic tau accumulates, and we see this inflammation in human AD, and in human AD and in primary microglia, we can see that microglia may be playing a role in synaptic phagocytosis. What we don't know yet is, well, a lot, but one of the things we don't know yet is whether the microglia are cleaning up dead synapses, and that would be a beneficial effect, or whether the microglia are aberrantly eating healthy synapses that are important for memory. And that's some of the future work we'll have to, we'll have to do. So here's sort of tying together the, the, the first and the second part of the talk. Uh, and I hope that I've convinced you that there are multiple different pathological proteins and risk genes that are contributing to synapse loss and that at least in mice, these changes are reversible. So we think that these are a, a very promising target for therapeutic intervention. And here again, it's less simple than the classic amyloid cascade and it's probably still not fully right, but a working model of what I think might be happening in terms of synapse degeneration is that things like ApoE4 and clustering, these risk genes, along with, of course, age and the lifestyle factors that we haven't talked about today, 
are influencing accumulation of A-beta, and in particular, APOE4 is causing it more A-beta to accumulate in synapses. A-beta, when it's in synapses, is definitely contributing to synapse generation, and our mouse data suggests that this may be acting via wild type tau, and that involves somehow neuron glia interactions, and in particular, increases in inflammatory gene expression, and perhaps microglial phagocytosis of synapses. I didn't talk about it today, but tau also, we think, is spreading through the brain via pre to post synapses, and that's something I think is important that we're working on more in the future. And altogether, we know that synapse degeneration is a very strong correlate of cognitive impairment. So before I take questions, I will quite cheekily give a couple of shameless plugs that the UK Dementia Research Institute in Edinburgh, not in particular my lab, but in the wider group, are hiring uh, postdocs and PIs. And if you're an early career researcher and starting your own lab, when I was a member of the Fens Cavalry Network of Excellence, I'm now old and an alumnus, uh, but we published some tips and some opinion articles that are freely available at the European Journal of Neuroscience. And as was mentioned kindly in the introduction, I've recently started a journal and that's aiming to uh, be a force for good in the field by promoting rigor and transparency and reproducibility in publishing translational neuroscience papers. So please do check us out online. Uh, we're publishing lots of good papers. So it just leaves me to thank especially our patient donors and their families who really generously make a lot of this work possible. All of the lab who've contributed over the years, which is a big list, it's even a bridge to fit on the slide. And you can see that they do dress up. So we had an 80s party at a recent meeting and, and everybody went for it. Um, and all of our collaborators and funders. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm really glad to have been YouTube streamed. <laughs> and now I'll try and make my face so I can see it. So apologies if you see multiple versions of our screen. Um, th that was a fantastic presentation and a great, uh, a great pieces of data. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, I, I, we do have a lot of questions, so I'll probably just uh, take the ones that are most relevant and hopefully you would answer the questions. But I do have one question before. I want to be selfish a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, do you think um, synaptic degeneration is a general feature of several other diseases, not just AD and frontotemporal dementia, for example, could it be also involved with epilepsy and other diseases? Because it's quite clear from your data that the synapse seems to be a hotspot of uh, the damage that happens in the brains of people that have diseases. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So we know for sure that synapse loss is a common feature to all of the neurodegenerative diseases. That is sort of self-evident by the definition, right? So any disease where there's loss of neurons, all those synapses will be lost. But in particular for Alzheimer's disease, we know that the loss of synapses exceeds the loss of the neurons. So you can't just explain it by the cell death. We're not as sure uh, in other parts of the field whether that's the case for other neurodegenerative diseases. But in terms of things like neurodevelopmental diseases, we know the synapse is again an important part. So things like fragile X and autism, there's some really good evidence that differential pruning or differential synaptic protein control is important. So it is generalizable, but I think the mechanisms for each disease may be distinct. So it would be great if we found one thing that could then help multiple diseases, but I have a feeling it will be multiple different mechanisms targeting a common phenotype. Absolutely. Okay, so we do have a question here. Um, the person says this may be naive as a bit, as a bit far from the field. As an APO protein person, does increased APO E4 as observed in synapse loss in AD mean or lead to lipotoxicity in the brain? Oh, it's definitely not naive. That's a great question. Not one that I particularly know a lot about, but apolipoprotein E, one of its main functions is cholesterol transport. It's in lipoparticles. It's mostly made and secreted in the brain by astrocytes, but it's also important in the rest of the body. And there is a huge amount of data suggesting that lipids are important in Alzheimer's disease. Cholesterol is important. It's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease if you have uncontrolled high cholesterol, for example. So I think it's definitely important. I don't really know how. One of the things that we sort of hypothesize is that bigger synapses need more lipids and more cholesterol. And so APOE is coming to those to bring the lipids that they need and it's inadvertently bringing the toxic oligomeric A-beta that it picks up because it binds it very strongly as mm -hmm. it passes through the oligomeric halos. 
we have a little bit of evidence for the picking up of A-beta, but zero evidence for whether this is related to cholesterol. But it's a really hot topic, and lipidomics has become a really important area of research in the field. Yeah, and I think this is from the same person who basically followed up that question with another one, saying, what is the risk of developing AD in human pathologies of lipotoxicity? So, for example, atherosclerosis or obesity. Hmm. Um, so I don't know the data off the top of my head for atherosclerosis, but in general, obesity is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and any vascular risk factor that you can think of is probably also a risk factor for Alzheimer's. So diabetes is a risk factor, obesity, um, any sort of small vessel disease, and these, in my mind, are linked to things like atherosclerosis. So I don't know if it would be directly linked to the the atherosclerosis or to the best vascular damage, but I think there are some important things there for sure to explore. Great. Uh, we, we do have another question here. Uh, it will be interesting for the uh, people asking questions to tell us where they are from, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> this person says, this is interesting. Do you think neuroinflammation signaling drives the tau pathology or the other way? And the cognitive loss more linked to the tau dysmetriosis or the associated inflammation? Yeah, also a good question. So hmm, I don't know yet. And this is the answer, unfortunately, to most of the questions that are going to come up, probably. I think uh, neuroinflammation and things that make your affect your microglia increase, increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease. So somehow I think microglia or maybe inflammation is an upstream process. But how it drives tau in particular, I really don't know. There's a little bit of evidence that where there's a lot of evidence that there is gliosis around plaques, and there's some papers also in human uh, brain from people like Alberto Serrano Pozo suggesting that there is accumulation of reactive gliosis in the vicinity of tangles as well. But I think that's probably a late effect. And whether it's driving the tau pathology, I, I really don't know. I think it could influence it probably through A beta, but don't really know yet. The cognitive loss, there is better data. So cognitive decline is definitely linked to tau pathology, and it's probably because tau is driving the cell death. Mm -hmm. So if you look at tau marching through the brain, it correlates very closely with cognitive impairment, not quite as closely as synapse loss, but it does seem to be very important. Um, and it correlates much more closely than pathological markers of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really clear that tau pathology is bad mm -hmm. and how it's related to inflammation is still unclear, but mm -hmm. a hot topic. Um, I want to be selfish again. I do have a question. I was wondering, what do you think, um, ha have you in your data, have you looked at what species of tau might be involved with these changes that you see? Is it tau, are they tau oligomers, fibrous or phosphor tau, you know, all these different species of tau that are out there? Yeah, we don't have directly that much data about this. So we've looked and we can find tau phospho tau and misfolded tau, all of those in human synapses and in the, in the mouse brain. I don't have really good data to know which of those is toxic or one of the questions I'm really interested in is which are the sort of seeds that spread through the brain and I don't have very good data to know which, which of those is true yet. Mm. Um, there's a, an awful lot of data to suggest that hyperphosphorylation of tau and misfolding of tau is important in the disease process uh, at least in terms of getting it off of the microtubules where it's important for stabilizing axonal microtubules, but I don't have any direct data about the different types of synapses yet. Okay. Uh, we do have another question about inflammation as well. Uh, he says, could anti-inflammatory agents with selectivity to neuroinflammation proteins be a focus of research in AD? What is the likelihood of breakthrough? Yes, that's another great question. So it is a big focus of research in AD. There have been a couple of clinical trials that unfortunately failed trying anti-inflammatories as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Um, we're not, you know, as a field, I don't know exactly why those didn't work out. It could be that they were the wrong anti-inflammatory, so targeting the wrong type of inflammation. It could be that it was too late in the disease process, but there's an awful lot going on to try and focus in, in on which sort of neuroinflammation is damaging and at which stage of the disease so that we could absolutely go in with anti-inflammatory agents. So that's that's a really hot topic of research now in the field too. Yeah, uh, we do have lots of questions, but uh, I mean, in, uh, uh, but we've, we've got only six minutes left. So I'm gonna be extremely selective now. <laughs> um, so there is this question, which uh, I'm not sure what, he says, is transgenic animal models of AD 
in, in transgenic animal models of AD, does it mean the offspring, offsprings have reached the pre-dromal and MCI stage as well? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but maybe you get what he means. Yeah, and it's a good it's a good point. So our transgenic animal models are not perfect by any means. So the ones that I talked about that have plaques, they model the early stages of the disease fairly well, where the brain has a lot of plaques and not really any tau pathology. So in our mouse models that have plaques in general, they have plaques, they develop a little bit of, of cognitive impairment, so maybe analogous to MCI, but they don't have much neuron loss and they don't have tau pathology. When we drive tangle pathology, there are technically models of FTD because wild type tau doesn't make tangle pathology, but when we drive tangle pathology, we can see neuron loss. So we're modeling sort of the later stages of Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia where, where tau is driving neuron loss as well as cognitive decline. Um, so yeah, it, our, our models have each have their own advantages and disadvantages, and we have to be really careful to ask questions of each model that it can answer and not infer too much about the disease or particular cognitive times in the disease from our models. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to probably ask uh, another question. I was wondering, uh, with the recent paper published about the APOE, tree mutation in which the patient so you, you yeah. Find, yeah so i was just wondering what what do you think how does this kind of fit in with the work are you probably going to look at whether to upregulate that mutation or to provide drugs that might mimic that what what are your thoughts yeah well for, i got really excited about this paper it was recently i think in nature medicine right so there's a an apoe 3 mutation called the christchurch mutation but we mm -hmm. i had to like dampen my expectations because this was an N of one. <laughs> but what they found, this, this study found that a person who has a familial mutation that causes Alzheimer's disease, and in her family, it causes Alzheimer's disease really early, like I can't remember if it was in their 40s, 50s, but early on. This woman who had an APOE mutation was in her 70s and didn't have Alzheimer's yet. So it looks like this particular mutation in APP could be protective. So of course I went straight to the lab. I was like, have you seen this? We want to look at this mutation and how it works. So it's going to drive a lot of of basic research for people like me, but we have to keep in mind that it was an N of one and there's a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. On a more global level though, that idea of changing APOE is quite important, right? Because we know that APOE2 is protective and APOE4 is a risk. So could we change your APOE4 in your brain to act more like APOE2 and protect people from Alzheimer's disease is something that's mm -hmm. been actively researched around the world. And I think it's a, you know, an interesting idea and potentially useful. Yeah. Um I think we've got three more minutes, but I want to, for the benefit of our, our, our audience like in Africa, I was wondering if you could quickly tell us, you know, you've been quite successful and uh, it would be interesting to hear some thoughts about what do you think people wanting to go into research should do to be successful? Any tips yeah. and advice? Sure. I think I actually, I think I actually might have a, a slide for this I can show. So, um, I would say loving and being interested in what you do is the most important thing, right? If you don't, if you're not really fascinated by it, it's 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 a hard path to follow. But here's the, an end of one career path. Um, and what I would point out here is I started my grad school in 1999 and you can see the, it looks like a lovely straight line all the way to professor, which I'm still super proud of. It never gets old, but that's my title now. But if you look at like the productivity as time goes on, so this is the year on the x-axis and the number of papers or, or income and grants on the y, you can see there are a lot of ups and downs. And if you look at, at, at why this is or some of the correlates of this N of one, you can see when my two kids were born, there were these dips in productivity. Uh, and when I moved the lab in 2013 into Edinburgh, there's this massive cliff of productivity. And when you try and look at grant income, no matter how, I, how hard I try and how many grants I apply for, it seems to be very spurious, right? Because funding is hard. So mm -hmm. what I would say to people is, if you're interested, it's the best job in the world you can have. It's hard work and you've got to be resilient and persistent because you're going to get knocked back and told no a lot. <laughs> so it's worth it. Um, but it's not the easiest path, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, on behalf of the uh, Secretary General of the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa, Professor Amadi Nhungo, I really want to thank you for giving such an uh, amazing presentation. I'm pretty sure a lot of the people that were listening uh, have been inspired.
And if you do not mind, if we do have a lot of uh, questions that are linked, we could forward it to the you so that you can respond back. Yeah. And uh, I hope that in the future you'll also honor another invitation or probably even visit Africa at some point. Thank you so much, Sara. I would love that. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you all for your questions. That was fantastic. All right. Have a nice evening. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.